Okay, good morning everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here, not least because an hour ago I was stuck on a train stationary about a mile outside Newcastle Station with no particular sign that we were going to be going anywhere anytime soon, so anything's better than sitting where I was. Um, but, um, uh, and I apologise for the title of this, which was um, taken from a previous iteration uh, of this paper. Um, but what I want to talk about really in the session, thinking about artefacts and, and the value that's made of them, um, is the way that um, I've been uh, link using sort of artefacts to uh, work both at a sort of bottom up micro scale and then scaling right up to um, global inquiry. And you can judge for yourselves whether that sounds a bit over, over ambitious or not when I've finished talking. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, research that I was doing, um, a project I was running when I was at Cambridge um, prior to moving to Lincoln, um, which has been running since 2005. Um, and it has focused very much on pottery analysis. Um, and I would say at this point, it's not me that does the pottery analysis. I am no um, uh, ceramicist, I'm no specialist in pottery. Um, uh, Paul Blinkhorn has done nearly all of the pottery analysis um, uh, with various other people um, doing some other areas. Um, uh, obviously, all mistakes and errors in interpretation are entirely my own, because um, Paul would never forgive me if I blamed him for that. Um, so, um, what I want to talk about is how this kind of analysis of, of small artefacts can be aggregated up to look at um, bigger events, and also to talk really about the, the wider social value of this, and both of these, I think, have uh, relevance for the sort of notion of archaeology as a global profession, because pottery is very uh, universal across um, large swathes of the world, and indeed you could do exactly the same with other categories of widely found, commonly used artefactual material. When I started doing this work, um, the aims really, um, the initial stimulus for it was to give young people an opportunity to take place in archaeological excavation and the work I wanted to do was in currently occupied rural settlements, the non-deserted rural settlements, having worked on rural settlement for a long time. And the method of, um, uh, the, the reason for doing that was that the currently occupied settlements have then been rather overlooked. The attention, uh, focus of attention had always rather been on deserted sites. So I wanted to, and uh, for those of you who don't know, um, the uh, distribution of deserted medieval villages is shown on the map on the left there. And as you can see, it's very biased. So if you're only looking at deserted sites and trying to understand settlement development or indeed the sort of historical development of a region or an area or country uh, from just looking at deserted sites, then um, it, you can't do do that um, because they're, they're not sufficiently widely uh, distributed. There are other issues around that which I won't go into now. But when you're working in inhabited places, you can't do those big open area excavations. You're reliant on people's goodwill. And the strategy we were using for this, um, that I chose for this, was one pioneered by Mick Aston in Shatwick, was these one meter square archaeological test pits. Now, these have become very widely um, used now, particularly as a sort of community archaeological activity. Back in 2005, they were a little bit more, um, a little rarer as a means of um, excavation. But they're very simple, very straightforward. Do one metre square, we go down in 10 centimetre spits, we give each spit a separate context number, um, all the finds are sieved. Um, and then mapped. Um, and the main finds uh, that are subject to large scale analysis is flint up to a point um, and pottery. And pottery is by far the most useful for this because um, it is of a date which is more closely connected with the settlements that we're looking at, which were medieval, post medieval, and modern. And, the, um, and it's also more closely datable, of course, than flint, which tends to potentially span large um, periods of time. Plus, as a medievalist, um, I'm interested in flint when it comes from buildings, but slightly less so from other things. That said, I do like flint, and I don't want to offend anyone who likes their flint. Um, so what I want to talk about, uh, just run through some of the outcomes from this. Um, when we first started this work in 2005, Houghton and Witten was the first, the second site we did any of this work in. And if you want to look at any of this data, it's all still on the University of Cambridge website um, for Access Cambridge Archaeology, which was a unit I set up there. So if you see any of these sites and want to go and have a look at the data, the um, uh, sort of distribution maps and the pottery reports are all on there. Um, Houghton and Witten in the first year, we did 11 pits, 11 one-metre squares, you know, not a big area. 
Um, this is the distribution of them. It's a twin village, so there's Houghton and where have we got a pointer? We've got a laser pointer. Um, well, I can't walk over and point at the screen or I'll lose the microphone. Anyway, twin village, uh, scatter of pits. Um, because we were digging with school children, um, teenagers, what we did on third day was I upsummed the results, very much hot off the presses. We had pottery expert on site, identify stuff as it came out the ground, but it's unwashed and he hadn't always seen all of it, so it was a bit rough and ready. But we were trying to demonstrate to the kids how this material could be used to advance knowledge, how the discoveries that they had made by digging this one metre square, unearthing this stuff from the ground. They knew they were new discoveries, there was no fakery about it, they knew they weren't repeating anything. I was wanting to demonstrate how this information could be used to generate new understanding. So we go round, we get them all in a room, ask them to put their hands up for the different periods they'd found uh, uh, artifacts, and then we put those on a map. And I then extemporise about what I thought it might mean. These first test bits of weapon. The most noticeable thing about this was when we looked at the, um, the couple of hundred years before the Black Death, um, all of the pits producing pottery are shown as circles there. As you can see, there's a reasonable scatter of them. And then after the Black Death, there were many fewer. Um, so this is a broadly similar length of time before and after. And as you can see, the sites producing pottery have shrunk back to just those two circles there, the white squares of pits that haven't produced pottery. So I sort of ventured that it's interesting, it looks as if they've contracted. I wasn't really terribly interested in settlement contraction, particularly at that time. I was more interested in settlement origins, actually. But each year we put a report of the work that had been done into the Medieval Settlement Research Group annual report. Um, and I ventured in this um, that, um, you know, this, this is a, there was a marked drop in the volume of pottery comparing pre-mid-14th pre century to post-mid-14th century and this might suggest contraction at this time. It was a bit risky going to print on this sort of thing, of course, and I did hedge it about with the normal, um, uh, you know, but we can't possibly be confident about this. Anyhow, as Houghton and Whitten built up and we went back and did more test pits, this same phenomenon recurred. So when I'm talking about the way this artifactual evidence can be used to link to global inquiry, I'm just going to focus on this Black Death period example, though there are other periods in history where it's potentially equally uh, revealing of those sort of bigger processes. Um, so here you can see Houghton and Whitton, by the time we'd got 30 or 40 pits dug. This is before the Black Death, and again, the white squares are test pits that don't have pottery, the circles are the ones that do have pottery. Um, the larger the circle, the more pottery, as you can see from the scale. Um, the blue, the grey and black refers to um, pottery that's come from contexts that have got later material in them and therefore might be disturbed. I initially thought this might be quite a problem, but actually I don't think there's a great deal of stuff moving around, in fact. But we've sort of got established in the convention of showing, uh, showing them differently, so we're carrying on with that. Anyhow, this is before the Black Death. And that's afterwards. So that pattern of contraction definitely prevailed. It definitely sustained as we built up a picture. Um, Houghton, the very first pit, we actually had community involvement, the school, the primary school dug a couple of pits as well. But over the years, as we carried on doing this work with the schools, more and more communities got interested in um, carrying out this same activity. It had quite a burst in 2009, I think it was, when we did some work at Kibworth in Leicestershire uh, with Michael Wood as a TV series, which brought the whole activity into uh, popular focus. Um, a, a classic example, if you like, of a community engagement was Perton in Hertfordshire. Um, we did just five test pits in Perth in the first year we were there, uh, which really wasn't going to be telling us anything very much about anything. Uh, but the residents of Perton then discovered that there were other villages which had by then had 20 or 30 pits at Houghton. We'd got 30 or so pits dug by then. Perton decided they weren't going to take this lowing down. They weren't going to rely on child labour. They were going to get stuck in themselves. So the next year, we did with the school children another five pits and the villagers did about another 20. So that was the end of the second year. We had the same thing happened the next year, and the year after that, and the year after that. 
And you can see how, as a community project, this really took off, and they were looking at filling in gaps and, and where to go next. And uh, you know, you can see how the, the empty areas, if you like, have, have been uh, filled up. There's still perhaps a little bit of, of a gap. They resolved on their website, the other, their Facebook page, they were going to stop digging and and. Um, start writing up now. It's where we write up year on year each of the pits, so they're going to pull it all together. And every time I see them, they've dug another couple of pits. You know, it's sort of surprisingly addictive. And in Perton, again, so it's 113 pits um, dug in Perton the last time I heard. This is before the Black Death, and that's afterwards. So this is in North Hertfordshire. Houghton & Whitton is in Huntingdon, well, North Cambridge, near Huntingdon. Um, Similar pattern, different sorts of sites, very similar pattern. We then found this taking off as a community project more and more widely. The Heritage Lottery Fund um, from 2002 has been very much more focused on uh, sort of smaller scale projects involving members of the public much more directly rather than the big sort of capital projects it started off with. We've had large numbers of um, projects taking place on this. Claire was the first one we did in Suffolk. Uh, with um, HLF money, and again, it's this same pattern before the Black Death and afterwards. Not quite such a big contraction. Perton, it's 76% drop. Claire, it's only 36%. Uh, so, sorry, so Claire, it's only 50% drop. But the same pattern. By the time we got to 2010, there was a series of seminars on crises, which James, you were involved with, I remember. Um, uh, looking at sort of a series of crises and I offered a paper on the 14th century to look at this data um, from which we got a large number of sites by then, um, each of which had been um, published uh, as we went along just in very short summary in the MSRG report and had this kind of individual t test bit by test bit short report done that are then topped and tailed as we finish work on each site. But of course, what we can do is put all the data into um, a, a, well, a spreadsheet at the very least um, and this is when we start to scale up from this individual artifact level to these sort of bigger pictures because what we've got here are six graphs showing the percentage of pits in each of the villages we've, we've looked at which are producing pottery of different dates. So um, and it's from top left, it's Roman, early Anglo-Saxon, late Anglo-Saxon, top right, uh, bottom left is um, high medieval before the Black Death uh, centre, at the bottom is uh, late medieval, post-black death, and then post-medieval, um, sort of 16th to 18th century. And you can see how you're almost like taking the pulse of these villages with this, um, with this data. And this is when you start to scale up, because when you look at something like the Black Death, this is a pandemic that spread across what was then the, the known world, uh, from the Western, well, from the European perspective anyway. Um, you know, it's attested vividly by contemporary writings. Um, it, uh, in headlines that the Daily Mail would probably have been proud of. Um, but actually, it's surprisingly difficult to look at the impact of it from either the historical evidence, because we don't have standardised before and after data on population levels. Archaeologically, we very rarely find plague burials. Uh, and when you're trying to excavate villages to see what the impact on the settlements was, Villages are very big. It takes a long time to excavate them. This is Warren Percy in Yorkshire. Over 30 years, they excavated the area shown in red. That amounts to less than a sixth of the total of the whole area of the village over 30 years. Um, so there is an evidence problem. When I pulled the data together that we had in 2010 for the Mellon seminars in Cambridge, um, thinking that I, I found myself repeatedly saying, well, there seems to be a drop after the Black Death, and started to wonder if I was suffering from a nasty case of confirmation bias. You know, I was looking for it that or there it was. Um, but actually, when we looked at it, 90% of the settlements showed a decline. And overall, the number of pits producing medieval pottery dropped by 44.7%. Now, the 0.7 does wander around a little bit, but it is sitting broadly around 45% and has been consistently since I first pulled this data together in 2010. So what this is, and this isn't just that these um, nucleated villages, we see it in dispersed settlements. This is Carlton Road near Norwich, where you can see at the bottom of the picture here and over to the left, uh, this is before the Black Death. We've got outlying farms that are um, a mile or more from the, you can see the blue grid squares, what size the scale is. Uh, the test pits, I would point out, are not shown to scale. 
Um, <laughs> if only. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, these are widely scattered, dispersed pattern of settlement. That's before the Black Death and that's afterwards. And you can see even in these outlying areas, you see that same pattern. And indeed, the area at the top of the picture, uh, which is uh, more compact, um, is very severely affected. The church is actually just the sort of, uh, sort of in the center of the image to the right-hand side where it says church farm. And we can see that drop. We can put it on a graph. We can see that drop from about 40% of pits produced two or more sherds of high medieval pottery barely 20% of pits produced two or more sherds of late medieval pottery. And we can look at the individual sites, so we can drill down into finding out what the, how that overall pattern relates to the individual sites. Um, and we can see differences. So Norfolk, for example, to go back for that, we can see very consistently nearly all of the Norfolk villages, and the county boundary is, of course, arbitrary, but um, it's just one way of sorting the data. Uh, nearly all of the villages in Norfolk show a sharp decline. In Suffolk, there's a much more varied pattern. And of course, the great thing with the archaeological evidence is we can map it at all sorts of levels. Um, and one day I will get this into a proper GIS linked database, and I think it will then be really, really interesting. Um, but even at this relatively crude mapping level of just um, so circles for different percentages of this is shown the percentage of excavated pits that are producing two or more sherds of high medieval pottery. So you can see Purton is in the bottom left-hand corner there uh, that I showed you. Um, so more than 60% of the test pits are produced in two or more sherds before the Black Death. And you can see how it shows how crowded Central East Anglia is before the Black Death. And indeed, uh, in, uh, look at North Norfolk as well, up sort of Wisbeach, Hindering and Binham, Wiverton, that area. This is before the Black Death and this is afterwards. And particularly in that Central East Anglian area, you can see how that, those villages are just contracting away. If we get a sort of vague idea of a kind of heat map of where the, the worst of the contraction is occurring, remember, none of these are villages that show any sign of contraction apart from what's coming from the pottery from those test pits. But broadly, the places that are showing the worst contraction are the areas highlighted in pink here. If we then compare that with the map of deserted settlements taken from this uh, map showing all of them across England. This is just East Anglia where we've been doing the work. You can see how similar that distribution is. And it suggests that the image we have from the deserted settlements, the settlement contraction, which in the case of the deserted settlements, continues to decline and ends up as being a, a terminal process where the settlement um, ceases to become inhabited is actually reflected and is just the tip of the iceberg because the same process is starting off in the settlements that didn't become permanently deserted. And we can also see the ones that didn't suffer contraction. I said 90% of the settlements did suffer contraction, but that does leave the 10% that didn't. And of course, the exceptions are always interesting. Uh, so Nayland down on the Essex-Suffolk border, for example, this is before the Black Death, and that's afterwards. It actually grows. And in fact, it has much more pottery coming out of it. Um, Warberswick on the Suffolk coast, um, we see, again, the volume of the number of pits producing pottery increases. But here there's interesting, there's a shift from this is before the middle of the 14th century, a couple of hundred years before that. Uh, we can see the concentration of pottery mostly on the right-hand side of the image, um, close to the, the sea, is just coming in on the bottom right-hand corner there. Um, and that's after the Black Death. There's many more pits of producing pottery, but there's been a shift in land, um, or a shift towards the new site of the church, the uh, church on the map there, it says PW, is um, mostly a 14th century construction. There's an earlier church um, further to the south, um, it's sur surmised. So we can see the exceptions, um, being able to see the generalities and the exceptions, we can start to drill into, once we know what happened to settlements in the aftermath of the Black Death and that whole 14th century uh, demographic crisis, which wasn't just the Black Death, a whole series of other factors. But once we know what happened to the settlements, we can then start to explore why that happened and look at processes uh, and explanations behind those processes. And of course, working in the historic period is hugely advantageous because we do have some historical information. One of the other interesting asides that's come out of this work is the severe lack of Roman pottery that we find from test pits in these currently occupied rural settlements, given how big Roman settlements are um, in southern England and how, uh, how frequent they are, how common they are, um, 
it would be surprising, you know, if you put a medieval settlement down at random, there's a good chance it'd be on top of Roman settlement, but fewer than 10% of the pits that we've excavated have produced more than a single shard of Roman pottery. Um, and one just wonders, I'm just wondering now, whether there's a Justinian plague type thing going on here. And now, 10 years ago, I would have laughed at myself suggesting that. But it's interesting when you see a period when you have got some historical register for what's going on and can start to look at cause and effect in an interdisciplinary way, working with people with other disciplines. And then there's the social impact of it. Um, as I said, this started off as a project with schools. It developed into a community project. Um, we have always been very assiduous about tracking the social outcomes. We're as interested in those as we are in the what it's telling us about historic settlement development and indeed um, history generally. Um, we can see the impact that it has on students. This is 14, 13, 14, 15 year olds we do most of this work with. You can see the impact it has on their attitudes to going to university. This was from the aggregating the more than 4,000 students that had taken part in the Field Academy by the end of 2013. Um, we uh, assess the skills there that are developing on it, um, report back to them on those skills and get them to think about the skills. So we know it works in these various skill categories. Uh, I talked about this, some of you may have heard me talking about this at this conference last year. And we, look, we can also see the impact it has on um, members of the wider public's engagement with archaeology and heritage, both of the sites they're working on, and their interest in archaeology and heritage more generally. So we can capture that information. And we can also look at the way the activity helps develop skills, um, the same sorts of skills that we assess within the students, the school pupils. We've also started looking at the impact that has on skills development within members of the public taking part as well. We're very, um, very apologetic to people for making the fill these forms in, but you can see how useful it is to have that information. And then, of course, there's the question of scaling it up. It's a terribly simple process. It's a one metre square. If you hit anything complex or difficult that looks like archaeology you don't understand, you can just stop and backfill. Um, it's sieving to look for finds. It's relatively easy uh, to spot finds if you well, we do everything through a standardised mesh. It's something that you can carry out quite easily with a large number of people and a small number of archaeologists on site and get an awful lot done. We've done a few other places outside the East Anglian region, and I just put this up to show this same Black Death <laughs> catastrophe curve, if you like, um, shows up when we're looking at um, uh, North Warmer, which is the green star in the background that for some reason hasn't appeared on the scale with a label. Um, uh, Kibworth we did with Michael Wood in Leicestershire, Castleton in Derbyshire in the Peak District, and Kibworth up in Yorkshire. Um, and you can see that, that, that same drop. So that suggests that we've got similar pattern going on elsewhere in the country presumably with the same 10% exception rate, maybe not. That's an open question. And what we'd really like to do is start to try and get some more information from other parts of the country. And indeed, until June of last year, um, more widely across Europe. Um, and indeed, let's hope this could be the sort of project or you know, these sorts of projects where you know, we've got a, an expertise within archaeological archaeological communities, both in the UK and beyond and globally. Other people will know their local pottery sequences. It may not be, it happens that in Britain there is a bit of a watershed in the middle of the 14th century, which is probably not a coincidence, but it does uh, invite uh, consideration of the issue of the 14th century demographic crisis. The watersheds in other countries, maybe elsewhere. Nonetheless, this is a this is a technique uh, using a very basic form of artifact, which can often be overlooked when the more uh, glittery and glitzy sort of artifacts are brought in by metal detectorists. But this sort of wide scale thing could actually look at, uh, you know, the impact perhaps of the Black Death across Europe. Can we uh, detect that? And of course, it's not across. It's not just across Europe. Um, and this is when we get to what was, uh, at the time of the Black Death, uh, the globe. Um, in as much as uh, you know, we know something about the progress and the uh, spread of the Black Death across Europe, and people are writing uh, books. Bruce Campbell has recently written a that's a riveting book about sort of long-term implications of the crisis of the 14th century. Um, but it's all rehashing old data, um, and the more new data we can get from this really um, universal, simple, perhaps underappreciated form, apart from the pottery experts in this room, of which I know there are some, um, 
you know, I think the potential for the information load in that is really what I wanted to stress here. So really, in summary, um, uh, just put a screen up there, summarising the outcomes there. Really, that this could be scaled up, could happen elsewhere. But even at a very local level, people are fascinated by what comes out of their garden and their tiny little piece of pottery, or even their bit of clay pipe, clay tobacco pipe or something. But actually, you can scale that right up and put that into context. And um, it is fascinating when you're talking to members of the public who are really interested in about their village and their plot, but then see how it compares to other people. There's a whole different level of interest that is um, stimulated by that. So the... Sorry, the, uh, I meant to take out the um, uh, staging there. Um, so, yeah, in conclusion, all those points, you've got so much you can get out of just these little sherds of pottery. Um, and so I just wanted to celebrate pottery with you. Thank you very much.